I slew multitudes of his men, and I smote him five times with the point of my javelin, with wounds from which there were no recovery. Memphis, his royal city, in half a day, with mines, tunnels, assaults, I besieged, I captured, I destroyed, I devastated, I burned with fire. His queen, his harem, his heir, and the rest of his sons and daughters, his property and his goods, his horses, his cattle, his sheep, in countless numbers, I carried off to Assyria. Esar Hadon Hello everyone, and welcome to the Conqueror's Podcast. Episode 5.6, Assyria's Final Conquest. First of all, I wanted to apologize for the long, long delay in releasing the latest episode. A combination of personal matters, exams and reports, and tons of pressure at work kept me from finishing and recording the episode. To those who sent me messages and who asked if anything went wrong or something, thanks for your worries, I'm all good, and I hope that I get back as soon as I can to releasing episodes on schedule, because believe me, we have lots and lots of great conquerors to discuss, and my will in continuing this podcast has only increased. Before we dig in, I wanted to talk about the matter of the episode numbering. Being that I wanted to keep the chronological order of the great conquerors, after episode 5.5 that covered the reign and conquest of tiglath pileser III, episode 6.1 and 6.2 took us back to ancient Egypt, where we covered the rise and conquests of the Nubian pharaohs. In this episode, we travel back to Assyria to cover the reign and conquest of Isar Hadun, the last great Assyrian conqueror. Now some of you may say, wait, why did he change the series number for the Nubian pharaohs and didn't continue the numbering from series 3? Well, although they were throughout the Egyptianized, as I said multiple times, the Nubian pharaohs were still Nubian and kept many aspects of their original culture. And although to most they weren't seen as foreign conquerors in the manner of later conquerors of Egypt, they still represented a distinct culture and founded their own dynasty. In this episode, however, we simply continue the story of the Neo-Assyrian Empire from where we left off in episode 5.5, so I thought that rather than numbering it as a standalone episode, it's more fitting to continue the numbering on that basis. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, back to Assyria. Last time we talked about the juggernaut of the Iron Age was in episode 5.5 when we covered the reign and conquests of perhaps the greatest of the kings of Assyria, Tiglas Pileser III. Despite usurping the throne, and despite probably having no royal blood, Tiglath Pileser was able to consolidate his rule, and by the end of his reign, he didn't just stop the empire's decline, he had made it stronger and larger than ever before. Upon his death, the throne passed to his son, Shalmanassar V. Unfortunately for us, as Shalmanassar V only reigned for five years before being violently deposed, not many sources covering his reign survive. That's because his successor slash usurper, whom we'll get to in a minute, did what any proper usurper would do and tried to erase his predecessor's memory in any way possible. Still, some sources survived, especially in Babylon and through the Bible. From what we know, Shalmanassar seems to have had the perfect background for the position of king. He inherited a strong and stable empire from his father. He served for many years as governor of some of the most prominent provinces of the empire and as an Assyrian prince, he probably had military training and experience. But despite all of these, within five years, he was violently deposed. The exact reason is not known, but it may have been his failure in doing what a proper Assyrian king was ought to do, war and conquest. And it wasn't for lack of trying. As soon as he took the throne, Shalmanassar set out to expand his empire. His campaigns were directed primarily west, against the Phoenicians, Anatolians, and most notably, the Jewish Kingdom of Israel. His campaigns, however, were long and indecisive, and included sieges that lasted many years. Against the former two, no major conquest or gain seems to have been achieved, while the siege of the Israelite capital of Samaria lasted for about three years. And while a debate still exists about who actually conquered the city, Shalmanassar or his successor, the fact that in the Babylonian Chronicles and in the Bible it is recorded that Shalmanassar was the one who captured the city 
means that it was probably him. Another possible reason for his deposition, and the one promoted by his successor, was the increase in the tax burden caused by the lengthy and ineffective campaigns of Sharm al V. In any case, after only five years on the throne, Sharm al V was deposed and probably killed by his usurper, Sargon II. We don't know a lot about Sargon II before his usurpation of the Assyrian throne. Hell, we don't even know his real name. What we can conclude from his reign is that he was a military man of high rank in the Assyrian army. Regarding ancestry, although he is presented in many modern sources as being the son of Tiglath Pileser III, in reality, there is no evidence to support him even being of royal blood. First is the name he took for himself. As mentioned in episode 2.2, which covered THE Sargon, the world's first great conqueror, the name Sargon was derived from the Akkadian Sharu Kin, which translates to the true or legitimate king. With this name, one can say that Sargon II may have simply chosen a name to honor the legendary Mesopotamian king. But then again, why would the rightful king take a title that says, I'm the rightful king? Other than that, well, he wasn't. Fun fact, as ancient as Sargon II is to us, his reign being dated to more than 2700 years ago, at that point, more than 1500 years had passed since the reign of the legendary Sargon the Great. Just think about that. To our modern ears, both rulers would sound ancient. But to the Neo-Assyrians, the Akkadians were already considered ancient history at that point. Just to give you an idea, Sargon I was as ancient to Sargon II as Justinian or Theodoric, both called the Great by the way, are to us today. Second is the fact that in all surviving records from his reign, and Sargon II made sure that there were many of these, only once is it mentioned that Tiglath Pileser was his father. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had just deposed a rightful king, an association with an illustrious father, such as Tiglath Pileser III, would have been in the let's say top 3 to-do list in my manual for usurper for boosting legitimacy. The fact that he didn't probably means that Sargon II saw that the claim was so far-fetched that he simply avoided it. Whatever legitimacy issues he had, Sargon II obviously had the support of the army and he more than made up for them with military acumen and some good old Assyrian brutality. As soon as he took the throne, Sargon II was faced with rebellions on all fronts. First, a revolt erupted in Babylonia, the region, not the city, led by a Chaldean ruler by the name of Marduk Apla Edina II, whom we'll go on to refer to as Marduk. Marduk was also assisted by the Elamites. The Assyrian forces stationed in Babylonia failed to quell the rebellion and were defeated at the Battle of Der in 720 BC. Soon, most of Babylonia including the great city of Babylon, were under Marduk's control. For now, Sargon decided to leave Babylonia, preferring to focus on other fronts deemed more urgent. Being that he isn't the main character of this episode, I won't go into too much details about all of Sargon's campaigns of reconquest. And when you're a usurper who spends most, if not all of your reign crushing rebellions and reconquering provinces, believe me, there were many. Two fronts which I can't simply mention without giving some details about are the Western and the Babylonian campaigns. The most urgent front seems to have been to the West, where many of the recently conquered territories had risen in revolt. Sargon personally took command of the Assyrian army and led it into Syria, where in 720 BC he met a coalition of local cities which included Damascus and Hamath at the Battle of Karkar, close to the spot where Sharmanassar III had faced the Syrian coalition that tried to stop the first Assyrian conquest more than a century earlier. As with the previous battle, the Assyrians were victorious, and after a round of good old Assyrian deportations and graphic public punishments, Syria was again subdued. He then marched south, punishing all rebellious cities and states. Two are mentioned specifically, Hamath and Samaria, indicating perhaps to the special treatment that we received. And while we don't know what exactly happened in Hamath, that in Samaria, capital of the northern Jewish kingdom of Israel, Sargon's retribution and deportations resulted in what is called the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel, should give us a clue. 
Sargon then continued his march as far south as Gaza, which quickly fell to his forces. This time, Sargon wanted to make it clear that the Levant was Assyrian. Any king or ruler even suspected of not being loyal to the king was removed, and garrisons were established all over as far south as the Sinai. Soon, an embassy was received from Egypt, who took notice of this encroachment of the greatest power in the world at that time, and sent gift to the king. Luckily for them, Sargon was far more preoccupied with other parts of the empire for him to consider invading Egypt. And so, friendly relations and trade were soon established. Sargon next turned his attention north, with campaigns launched primarily against the Anatolian city-states and against Assyria's old enemy, Urartu, all of whom had taken advantage of the unrest in Assyria, um, the unrest caused by Sargon, yes, to expand their territories and expel any Assyrian influence. Again, I don't want to get into too much detail, so in short, in a series of campaigns lasting more than five years, the Anatolian kingdoms either submitted or were defeated, lost territory was retaken, and some new territory added to the empire. Urartu, at this point far weaker than it was during the reign of Tiglath Pileser III, was also defeated, its lands pillaged, its king replaced, and it was made to pay tribute to Assyria. With all other fronts pacified, and even some new conquests under his belt, Sargon could now focus his full might on Babylon. His first target was there, the place where his army was defeated years ago. Although the city itself held out and remained in Assyrian hands, its surrounding areas fell to enemy hands. Sargon proceeded to have the area pacified and reincorporated it to the empire, re-establishing a garrison and appointing a new governor. After repelling Ailamite attack from the east, Sargon set his eyes on Babylon. Instead of marching straight to Babylon, Sargon decided to march south along the Tigris. The Assyrians marched as far south as the city of Dur Athara, which although heavily defended, was quickly taken and made capital of a new province. He then marched west, crossing the Tigris and one of the tributaries of the Euphrates, thus coming upon Babylon from the totally unexpected southeast of the city. Marduk, obviously shocked from the no doubt great army marching from that direction, courageously fled the city with as much treasure as he could carry, hoping to bribe the Elamites into assisting him. The Elamites, for their part, had tasted enough Assyrian metal, and after accepting Marduk's, um, gifts, they politely told him, No. To cut the story short, Sargon pursued Marduk wherever he fled, but eventually agreed to spare his life in exchange for his surrender. With his empire restored, and his armies victorious on all fronts, Sargon, the usurper, reigned supreme. An active builder, he launched numerous construction projects across the empire, while making sure that any mention of his predecessor was removed of course, and even ordered the construction of a whole new capital for the empire, which he named Dur Sharukin, meaning Sargon's fortress, and to which he relocated his court in 706 BC. Unfortunately for Sargon, he didn't get to enjoy his shiny new capital for long, because a year later, he was dead. What's really shocking was not his sudden death, but rather the way in which he died. In 705 BC, Sargon led his army into battle against the new people, the Chimerians. The Chimerians were a nomadic Indo-European people whom, similar to many later nomadic people, probably fought as horse archers. In a relatively minor battle, Sargon led the charge against the enemy and was killed. As if that wasn't enough, his soldiers were unable to recover the body, a very, very bad omen for a superstitious and warlike people as the Assyrians. The death of their king, who was, remember, the god Ashur's viceroy on earth, sent shockwave throughout the empire. Although not the hero of this episode, and more of a restorer than a conqueror, Sargon II ranks as one of the most capable and definitely most warlike of all the kings of Assyria. Of course, one could argue that the crisis which the empire faced, and which he dealt with, was his own doing. Still, the guy was obviously a great king. Sargon II was succeeded by his son, Senachrib, whose reign could not be described by a better word than monumental. Why? Let's see. First of all, some background. Unlike many previous Assyrian kings, Senachrib, similar to Shalmanassar V, was properly groomed for the position of king. 
He was the heir apparent for more than 15 years, and his father made sure to prepare him as much as possible, even entrusting him with the administration of the Assyrian home provinces. When he did assume the throne, he was already an adult, and the empire was relatively peaceful. Upon assuming the throne after his father's violent death, Sennacherib is described as becoming very superstitious, constantly seeking explanations as to what sin his father had committed for him to suffer such an end. He also immediately abandoned Dur Sharukin, considering it to be a cursed place. Sennacherib also broke off with a major, major tradition of all Assyrian kings, his depiction as a great military leader. It's not that Sennacherib totally avoided such depictions, it's just that he seems to have preferred to be depicted far more as the builder, stability-seeking king, rather than a conqueror. Don't worry though, Sennacherib was a warrior through and through, and like any other great Assyrian king, led the Assyrian armies. No major conquest occurred during his reign, but notable events include the total subjugation of the kingdom of Judea, battling and defeating the Egyptians for the first time, his total victory over the Elamites, and finally, his reconquest and destruction of Babylon, yes, destruction, after the great city rebelled yet again. And by destruction, I mean destruction. The city of Babylon was raised to the ground. But just like his father, what was perhaps most notable about Sennacherib's reign was actually its end. Because Sennacherib was assassinated by his own sons. You heard it. In 681 BC, the king of mighty Assyria, self-proclaimed ruler of the world, was assassinated by his own sons. This happened after his eldest son and heir apparent, whom he had appointed as king of Babylon, was taken prisoner and probably executed by the Elamites and the Babylonians. Reason one for the aforementioned destruction. His choice for a successor then fell on another son, Esar Hadon, who wasn't his oldest surviving son. That one was a guy called Arda Mulisu. In retaliation, Arda Mulisu conspired with another brother and attacked and killed their father in one of Nineveh's temples. The act itself, as well as the location chosen for it, I mean guys, really, a temple, showed the old man some respect, alienated many of their supporters. In Judea and Babylonia, on the other hand, these news were received with delight, and his fate was seen as divine retribution. In the meantime, Esar Hadon was in the western provinces, and upon receiving the news, he gathered an army and marched east. When the two armies met, most of Arda Muliso's army defected to Esar Hadon, and the two conspirators fled north. After purging the court and executing all collaborators as well as anyone responsible for the security of the court, Esar Hadon became king of Assyria. As I said before, Esar Hadon is the last great Assyrian conqueror. Although his 12 year long reign is generally more notable for its cultural and economic achievements, perhaps the greatest military achievement of the empire was accomplished by Esar Hadon, the conquest of Egypt. Regarding sources, these are abundant. Many Assyrian letters, decrees, and records survived in many of the excavated Assyrian cities, while the Babylonian chronicles, which are surprisingly positive toward Esar Hadon, also provide us with a valuable source. Before we get to the war stuff, three things we have to talk about Esar Hadon. First, the guy was paranoid. Very, very paranoid. Having a usurper as your grandfather, and having your brothers assassinate your father before coming for your head, probably played a major role. And from the very beginning, Esar Hadon was always wary of any conspiracy or plot against him, and he built a huge spy network across the empire. As a result of the king's paranoia, the women of the court came to wield great influence at court, since Esar Hadon would not trust any male family member with any position of power. In my opinion, this paranoia, coupled with apparent health issues, make his achievements even greater. Second, Esar Hadon was superstitious, extremely superstitious. No major act, including wars or battles, would be launched without the king asking for some form of divination. And if the divinations were negative, the matter at hand would simply be postponed or cancelled. Third, Esar Hadon was a sickly individual, both physically and mentally. His aforementioned paranoia is one obvious trait. He also seems to have suffered from depression, also for obvious reasons. From the surviving records, 
He also seems to have suffered from bouts of illness that kept him incapacitated for long periods of time. The problem with that? When you're the mighty king of Assyria, a living demigod, you're not supposed to be fragile and weak. The solution? The Assyrians had this ritual called the substitute king, which involved the Assyrian king going into hiding for a hundred days, during which a substitute took the king's place. During these hundred days, the actual king remained hidden and was known only under the alias, the farmer. The goal of the ritual was that any evil intended for the king would be absorbed by the substitute king, who was killed regardless if anything had happened at the end of the hundred days, keeping the real monarch safe. Let's just say that according to the sources, this ritual was implemented for a couple of times by Esar Hadron. Okay, now for the important stuff. One of the first acts of Esar Hadron's reign was not a militaristic one, but rather one of peace. In 680 BC, he ordered the complete reconstruction of the city of Babylon. Only nine years had passed since his father ordered the complete destruction of the city, an act which Esar Hadron the superstitious god that he was, probably considered as blasphemous and as a reason for his father's demise. And this reconstruction wasn't just physical. He ordered that the inhabitants of the city, now scattered throughout the empire, either as slaves or deportees, be called back to the city. The reconstruction project was so great that it would not be completing during Esar Hadun's reign. It was not only important because it illustrated goodwill towards the Babylonian people, but also because it allowed Esar Hadun to assume one of the essential characteristics that the Babylonians invested in kingship. While the king of Assyria was generally supposed to be a military figure, the king of Babylon was ideally a builder and restorer. Due to this great act, Esar Hadun was very popular in Babylon, and was perhaps the first Assyrian king who not only claimed the title of king of Babylon, but was also widely accepted by its populace. A year later, in 679 BC, Esar Hadon set out on his first campaign as king. The campaign was directed against what would prove to be his greatest conquest, Egypt. Militarily, ever since their defeat by his father, the Egyptian front had remained quiet. But in Sennacherib's final years, the Egyptians had begun sending agents and contacting local rulers in the eastern Mediterranean in order to stir unrest against Assyrian rule. These acts seemed to have intensified upon Esar Hadon's ascension so he wanted to send a message to the Egyptians, now led by Pharaoh Taharqa of the 25th or Nubian dynasty. The Nubian dynasty had by now firmly consolidated its hold over Egypt, and seeing themselves as the heirs of the pharaohs of old, now eyed the Levant. Assembling his army, Esar Hadon marched east from Assyria until reaching the Mediterranean. He then marched along the coast, receiving tribute and subduing troublesome rulers along the way. He continued his march until reaching the city of Arza, close to the modern city of Al-Arish. The city was sacked and its ruler, and probably many of its people, deported to Assyria. Esar Hadon seems to have been pleased for now with these achievements, and after seeing that no response was coming from the Egyptians, and upon receiving troubling news from the north, he declared victory and withdrew. A great victory and good PR, yes, but no conquest for now. Those troubling news that the king had received were about raids by the Cimmerians the people who killed Esar Hadon's grandfather. They were back and were launching raids into the empire from Anatolia. Esar Hadon rushed north and was able to force a pitched battle upon the Cimmerians near Khobushna, in southeastern Anatolia. We have little information about this battle other than Esar Hadon's boast about slaughtering many of the invaders. The northwestern front and the restoration of lost territories there seem to have been Esar Hadon's main military focus for the next couple of years. The next major military action occurred in 677 BC, when the king of Sidon, Abdi Milkuti, along with a man called Sarduri, who was the king of Kundu in Cilicia, rose in revolt against the empire, apparently as Esar Hadon was either about to launch a campaign, or had already launched one into Cilicia. Now Sidon had only recently been revassalized by Sennacherib, and it was allowed to retain its own kings, laws, and territory. We don't know what caused the rebellion, but Egyptian involvement is to be suspected. This act, along with the timing, no doubt pissed Esar Hadon, who led his army south and besieged the great Phoenician city. No information regarding the siege itself survived, other than that Sidon was taken and destroyed, with its population deported to Assyria. Its king escaped, but his family was deported along with the rest of the population. 
Next year, it is recorded that Esar Hadan was able to capture both Sarduri and Abdi Mikuti, who is described as being caught at sea. Both kings were executed, and their heads, along with the deported people of Sidon, were paraded in Nineveh. Some of Sidon's cities and towns were granted to King Baal of Tyre, who had recently become a vassal of the empire. With the Levant quiet again, Esar Hadon returned north to continue his campaign. The Chimerians were defeated, though they were apparently not subdued, nor any major territorial gain achieved. War was also waged against Urartu, and the conquest of one of its vassal states, Shubria, is recorded. Campaigns were also waged against the Median tribes in the northeastern areas of the empire, as a result of which many of their tribes became vassals of the empire. In 675 BC, Esar Hadon and his armies were forced to hurry to southern Mesopotamia as a result of a raid by Ilam. Taking advantage of the Assyrians' absence, the Ilamites raided deep into southern Mesopotamia and were even able to take the city of Sippar. By the time Esar Hadon arrived, however, the Ilamite king had died and his heir was apparently in the awkward position of not being able to continue the campaign. He quickly withdrew his forces, returning all captured goods and prisoners and even returned items captured on previous campaigns. An alliance was soon announced between the two sides, with royal children exchanged, allowing Esar Hadon to return to the north. Okay, so up until now, Esar Hadon isn't looking like any great conqueror. He was an able king and commander, no doubt, who personally led his armies, but a conqueror fit to be included in the Conqueror's podcast? Not really. Sure, he conquered Sidon and some northern territories, but these were minor conquests, and some could even be considered as mere restoration of lost territory. But that was about to change, because Esar Hadon was about to take a shot at what was no doubt the greatest challenge in Assyria's history, Egypt. Even his great and far more warlike predecessors like Tiglath Pileser III and Sargon II had not attempted such a feat. But in 674 BC, Esar Hadon felt sufficiently strong and was probably irritated enough by the Egyptians to launch an invasion into the great and ancient kingdom. The reasons for conquering Egypt are obvious. The first and most obvious reason was the wealth and fertility of Egypt itself. An empire that would control the Euphrates, Tigris, and the Nile? Just think about the resources such an empire would command. The second reason was the prestige and fame Esar Hadon would achieve by conquering Egypt, one of the greatest and most ancient civilizations in world history. Again, although to our modern ears Assyria itself sounds ancient, to the Neo-Assyrians, ancient Egypt was already a legendary ancient land, with the Old Kingdom being more than 1500 years ago. The third, and in this case perhaps most important reason, was Egyptian meddling in the Levant, as they seem to have constantly sent agents and bribes hoping to stir unrest there. As I mentioned before, the Nubian dynasty wanted to expand their power over to the Levant, which they probably considered as lost Egyptian territory. Esar Hadon, the paranoid king that he was, probably wanted to crush any Egyptian hopes for reconquest. Now, we shouldn't look at it from our modern point of view as a mere clash of civilizations or just another war of conquest for the Assyrians. It was far, far more. Let's start with the geographical and logistical challenges. Egypt was the farthest land by far that the Assyrians would have to march to. Just to reach the Nile Delta, the Assyrian army would have to march more than 2,000 kilometers. Add to that the fact that Esar Hadon knew what he was up against. It wasn't a mere city-state or some small kingdom in Anatolia. It was the kingdom of Egypt. Although it wasn't the great power it was 500 years ago, it was still a formidable foe, recently rejuvenated by the Nubian pharaohs. So Esar Hadon knew that the army he would have to lead would have to be one of the largest, if not the largest, in Assyrian history. Now all these men, horses and followers, would have to be fed. So just think of the logistics involved. Now all these were just the physical issues. Just think about the psychological ones. To a mere Assyrian soldier, Egypt was a distant, exotic land who was a world away. Hell, it lay on a different continent. To reach it, they would have to cross the Sinai Peninsula, which was mostly a desert region. Also, remember that for the Assyrians, it was an entirely new land, inhabited by an alien people with a strange language, gods, and customs. The farthest the Assyrians had ever reached in Egypt at that point was El Arish, 
and even that was for a short time. Think of what lay ahead, the vast Nile Delta, the sands of Egypt, and the mighty Nile River. Even those with some knowledge like Esar Hadon would have known that it was a great and ancient civilization. They would have heard tales of the greatness of the pyramids and Sphinx, and of the great warrior pharaohs who once ruled over the Levant. In 674 BC, the Assyrian army set out towards Egypt. Of this great and glorious campaign, no doubt one of Assyria's greatest up to this point, we know almost nothing. That's right, nothing. Assyrian sources are scarce and hold little detail, and even the Babylonian chronicles don't give too much information. What are we to conclude? Well, let's just say that in Mesopotamian chronicles in general, and in Assyrian ones in particular, the greater the triumph, the greater the boast, and the greater the defeat, well, the greater the silence. So let's just say that the Assyrian chronicles went airplane mode in describing this campaign. What we do know from the few fragments that do survive is that Esar Hadon, hoping to catch Taharqa and the Egyptians off guard, forced march his great army towards Egypt. This strategy, however, backfired, because upon arriving to Ascalon, modern-day Ashkelon, Israel, with his now weary army, he found the Egyptian army waiting for him. Caught off guard, the Assyrian army was utterly defeated. However, despite this great defeat, it seems that the Assyrian army inflicted enough damage upon the Egyptians that Taharqa wasn't able to follow up on his victory. Also, when you're a paranoid king who ascended the throne in the circumstances that Esar Hadon did, your fears get an extra boost, and even if the defeat wasn't that great of a deal, Esar Hadon may have been reluctant to have the slightest risk to his reign, and so had his censors work extra time to ensure it. Following this defeat, Esar Hadon withdrew to Nineveh. If the Egyptians or his enemies at court thought that following this defeat, Esar Hadon would just give up, well, they had another thing coming. In 672 BC, Esar Hadon raised an even greater army and again marched towards Egypt. His first target this time, however, wasn't Egypt. It was the Phoenician city of Tyre. You may wonder, why march on Tyre, who at this point was a vassal of the empire? Well, it seems that its king, Baal chose to revoke the treaty he had with Assyria and side with Taharqa. Tyre, a great port city, was probably one of the main targets of the aforementioned Egyptian meddling, and its rulers no doubt yearned for the independence the city had enjoyed for centuries. So collaborating with the Egyptians against the Syrian power isn't that hard to believe. It is also my personal theory that the early Egyptian knowledge of the first invasion had something to do with the Tyrians. While all the cities under its rule were quickly taken, the great city of Tyre itself proved to be a tough nut to crack, and despite Esar Hadon's boast of conquering the city, it seems that Tyre held out. What is probable though, is that after making sure that Tyre was completely surrounded and cut off, Esar Hadon left a sizable contingent to maintain the siege, while he continued south towards Egypt with the main army. And this time, the Assyrians were ready. Esar Hadon did not rush his army, and he made sure that proper reconnaissance was conducted, so as to avoid special surprises like the last time. They marched south from Phoenicia along the Mediterranean coast. Along the way, they were assisted by some local Bedouin Arab tribes, who also supplied them with camels for the desert crossing. The Assyrian army entered Egypt proper from the northeast and continued their march along the coast towards the delta. In a typical Assyrian straight to business attitude, after reaching the Nile, they headed straight towards Memphis, capital of the 25th dynasty. Taharqa sent all the forces at his disposal, but in three major battles, the last of which was fought only four days march from Memphis, the Assyrian army was victorious. Unfortunately, we don't have any information regarding these battles, nor the numbers of troops involved. However, given that the Assyrian army was probably one of the greatest ever assembled by the empire, and that the Egyptians were fighting on their home turf, Tens of thousands of soldiers on each side would sound reasonable. What is certain, however, is that the Egyptian defeat was complete, as within four days of the last battle, Memphis was taken without a siege, with Taharqa fleeing south to Nubia, while the royal family, including the crown prince, were taken prisoner. The next couple of months were spent by the king appointing governors, establishing garrisons, 
consolidating Assyrian control, and of course, deporting thousands of Egyptians to Assyria. Egypt, or at least Upper Egypt and the Sinai, were now Assyrian. Esar Hadun understood that conquering Egypt and subduing it were two completely different things. He would have probably stayed longer to oversee the establishment of Assyrian power there, but he had to return to Assyria because, well, you know, there's this whole managing of the greatest empire the world had ever seen. Also, a rebellion is recorded to have occurred that required the king's attention. Esar Hadun probably expected what happened after his departure. Taharqa, rebuilding his power in the south, began to encroach on his lost territories and stir unrest across Upper Egypt. Soon, he even managed to reconquer Memphis and stir rebellions in Lower Egypt. Esar Hadun doesn't seem to have been too worried. After all, he still controlled the delta, the road to Egypt was clear and now fully under Assyrian control, and his army had already proven that it could crush the Egyptians at will. He probably thought to himself that just one more campaign, one more effort, he'll be back and Egypt would quickly be subdued. And indeed, in 669 BC, Esar Hadun began assembling another great invasion force in Assyria. Unfortunately, it was not to be. While on the route to Egypt, near the city of Haran, aged only 44, Esar Hadun died. He had ruled the empire for about 12 years, and although by the time of his death, the conquest of Egypt wasn't complete, it was no doubt his greatest achievement, and it paved the way for his successor to complete his task. And luckily for the empire, Esar Hadun, despite his relatively young age, proved yet again his worth as king, and had already planned his succession, as strange as it was. He had decided that Shamash Shum Ukin, probably his eldest son, would succeed him to the throne of Babylon, while his other son, Ashurbanipal, would succeed him to the more senior throne of Assyria. Although Isar Hadun probably intended the brothers to peacefully cooperate and share power, well, we all know how these things usually end up. Luckily for Esar Hadun and the empire, however, things would actually turn out okay, as Ashurbanipal would prove to be a very capable king and would go on to reign as the last great king of Assyria, making sure that during his reign at least, Assyrian power did not decline. Eventually, however, like any other emperor throughout history, that decline came, as Ashurbanipal's successors failed to hold the vast empire they inherited. But as one empire falls, others rise to take its place, and next episode we will cover the history and rise of one such empire, that of the Medes, the ancient and mysterious Iranian people who, after breaking off from Assyrian rule, allied with a certain rebellious South Mesopotamian city in order to take on the waning, but still formidable, might of Assyria. In the meantime, I'd like to thank all listeners and supporters of the podcast, and again apologize for the very irregular schedule and delay in releasing this episode. I hope that by next episode, things will be much more organized. As usual, if you like the podcast, spread the word, it helps a lot. The podcast is available on all platforms and on YouTube. See you next time.